Hello, Spink here. This is episode 6 of my Let's Play of Age of Civil War 2. Uh, last turn we had the, uh, the uh, amazing event of finally um, processing the turn. So we're, we're actually in turn 2 now. So uh, we had just executed the turn. And we hadn't uh, hadn't looked at any of the uh, any of the results from it yet, so that's what we're going to do now. Uh, we're going to look at the um, the messages that uh, that are displayed during the uh, the turn. I generally try to try to have a uh, a set way, a set order that I go through and do things each turn. Um, I'll go through and look at the messages, then I'll take care of my units, and then I'll look at production and whatnot. So. First thing we're going to do, we're going to go through the um, the message that popped out. So Lincoln's call for volunteers. To augment the reduced regular army, President Lincoln asked the governors of the loyal states for 75,000 militiamen to serve for three months, the maximum time permissible under existing law. He did not foresee a long war. The northern states responded with 100,000 men, but the call for militia to suppress the rebellion was angrily and promptly rejected by the eight slave states still in the Union. I believe it came uh, actually earlier than, than this, but... Next we have martial law in Maryland. The rioting in Baltimore and other events prompted a federal declaration of martial law to ensure the safety of the troops and the loyalty of the state government. The Union Army entered Baltimore and occupied the city. Several disloyal Maryland state legislators who were believed to support secession were imprisoned. Troops were garrisoned throughout the state normalcy returned and the Maryland legislature officially rejected slavery. Officially rejected secession, pardon me. Tennessee elections. The Tennessee secession ordinance called for the election of congressmen to be held on the same day as the previously scheduled USA congressional elections. On the first Thursday of August, the voters went to the polls to choose congressmen for either Richmond or Washington. In the four eastern districts, the victors took their, state, their seats in the USA Congress. In the rest of the state, the seven victors took their seats in the CSA Congress. Surprisingly, the losers, the losers acknowledged defeat and declined to take the vacant seats in Richmond or Washington. Uh, so that's Eastern Tennessee. Eastern Tennessee is going to be a an area that's going to have high union sentiment. What can we see here? 50, 65... Get five. Here's Tennessee. Here's the Allegiance. So you see, we do have this area of of Eastern Tennessee is going to have high. We we do have some Union sentiment here. 65 Unionists over here, as opposed to the western part of the state, 15% Unionists. So this is something that uh, we can maybe keep uh, used to our advantage. One thing it is going to do is as Confederate troops move through this area, we're going to be able to see them as we did a little bit during the uh, execution of the turn that we saw last episode. We'll, we'll, we might be able to uh, get some information coming through there. Next. Northern papers push for an immediate offensive. Forward to Richmond. The rebel Congress must not be allowed to meet there on the 20th of July. By that date, the place must be held by the National Army. New York Tribune. Early in the war, many newspapers in both the North and the South were counting on one grand battle to end the war quickly. Northern newspapers, in particular, pushed the, conf pushed the government to march south and kill the snake in its nest by taking Richmond before the first Confederate Congress could meet. The pressure forced the hands of both military and civilian leadership who could move and risk battle with an untrained and untried force, or delay and submit to being mauled by the media. In mid-July, the Union Army moved south with the largest force seen to date in the northern, in North America, and both sides a taste, and gave both sides the taste of the horse to come. Now what this event does here, this push for immediate offensive, this is going to require that we take Manassas um, by a certain date, and I believe it's it's sometime in October or, or so, um, later on this year, 1861, and if we fail to do so, we're going to suffer a national morale hit. I believe that's what that's all about. Next, expiration of the first term. After 90 days, the first volunteer units were mustered out of service and reorganized. President Lincoln increased recruitment and called for three-year volunteers. So this is actually the end of that first uh, 
message we saw about the 90-day uh, volunteers, so that was actually something that occurred prior. Congress enacts the first income tax law, a 3% tax on income over $800 is established, aiming to bring $20 million into the federal coffers. This was the first income tax in the USA. Congress enacted this Revenue Act on 1861 to pay for what is anticipated to be a short civil war, as civil wars tend to be. Confiscation Act. The U.S. Congress issued on August 6th an act to confiscate property used for insurrectionary purposes. This act declared all property belonging to insurgents to be lawful subject of prize and capture wherever found. And this is something that actually led to the uh, contraband um, where uh, slaves could be declared contraband and seized. Congress authorizes pay for volunteers. Congress sees that the number of free volunteers dwindle and therefore authorize the government and military to offer an enlistment premium to attract more of them. Next. Camp Dick Robinson, a union. The union established a military camp near Lexington in central Kentucky as a show of force. Named Camp Dick Robinson, the camp became a rallying point for the mountaineers of southeastern Kentucky and eastern Tennessee to join the Union forces. The establishment of Camp Dick Robinson was also the only excuse Confederate officials required to place their own troops within Kentucky borders. Uh, camp Dick Robinson, my uh, great-great-grandfather, joined the Union Army here in Kentucky. to represent the his okay no cores before 1862 to represent the historical organizational difficulties and military thinking mentality in red tape no cores are allowed to be formed before March 1862 however you can create divisions if you wish but only from October 1861 so and then it has a mention here of where you find that in the manual this is something we talked about in in the episode on command and now we have the battles that happened. Here was our little gunboat action. This is looks like they're in reverse order, so this is the one that really didn't do anything. Next we have, this was the awesome battle of Manassas, where well, we kind of get spanked. So, as can happen. Next, this was our battle in the Mississippi Confluent, where foot took out a uh, or this was the second fight against this gunboat squadron and here was his first one where he took out the transports okay so um, the first thing I do when uh, starting a new turn is I as I go through and check out all of the uh, the messages and some of them are going to be the same as those pop-ups that we just saw I'm going to hit this first filter and this is going to tell us our scripted events and these are the ones we just saw, so there's no need to click on them again. If you do click on them, click on the little um, icon off to the side. It'll pull it up just like we saw earlier. But I do like to hover over them because occasionally they'll, they'll give us some information. Like here, that uh, Lincoln's call for volunteers gives us 50 tons of war supplies and 75 conscript companies. And 13 volunteer brigades got raised up, so that's kind of nice. Martial Law in Maryland produces the Volunteer Brigade in Baltimore and 20 conscript companies and 5 tons of war supplies. Nice. So if we hover over those, they'll probably show us these. Changes from options and events. So yeah, we'll see those kind of things. Uh, Tennessee Elections doesn't tell anything. Northern Papers. Here we go. Northern Papers push for the immediate offense. So this was the On to Richmond one that we, we saw here. It says, threaten Richmond, which means establish military control of Manassas by mid-September, or lose 10 national morale. So that's, uh, that's not inconsequential. So by mid-September, so presumably that means at the beginning, we have to have this by the beginning of the late September turn. Uh, pfft, we'll just have to see how that works. Expiration of the first turn. Oh, so there's one that we just lost 100 conscript companies. So we uh, we gained them and we lost them all in one turn there. Uh, normally, if you play the uh, the earlier start, the April start, uh, these don't all happen at the same time. They'll come in at their historical uh, at their historical start, historical time. Uh, General McDowell is active this turn, and this is by script. Um, even um, even though normally 
he would or would not be um, active just based on his uh, ratings. It's scripted to have him be active. General, Part General Patterson is not retained in command by W. Scott removed. General Patterson removed from place. So this is what we had talked about earlier. General Patterson is gone with his uh, rather unusual uh, uh, little ability he had. Congress enacts the first income tax law that gave us $200,000, the same amount every year after that, or slightly increasing. So this is a uh, an ongoing uh, uh, increase in our in money that we're going to see. The Confiscation Act gave us $2,000, or $200,000, and plus five national morale. Congress authorizes pay from volunteers. That didn't give us anything in particular. New military options are available on the F3 screen. If we hit F3, we can see that's this premium for volunteers. We'll be able to select that and be able to increase our manpower at the cost of some of our money. Um, the Confederacy has decided to print more money. So they'll see a little bit of, uh, little bit of uh, inflation over that. New industrial options are available. F5, let's hit those. What this is going to allow us to do, if you recall from when we were looking at the uh, at production and the various uh, facilities within each city that produce war supply and whatnot, we're going to be able to invest some money and some war supplies into building more of those facilities. So we'll be able to increase our, uh, our, our uh, production of war supplies. Uh, new diplomatic options are available. Let's take a look at that on F6. This is something we were talking about earlier as well. This is where we're going to be able to declare this blockade and possibly drop that foreign intervention box. As you can see, it was five last turn. Now it's eight, so it's, it's, it's inching up. Mm, the Confederacy has decided to offer some trade concessions to foreign powers. So that conceivably is what brought, um, what brought this up a little bit, perhaps. Brigadier General Mansfield is awaiting a new command. If we were to click on this, so it would show us where that's at. And that's going to be right here. Uh, General Fremont is waiting a new command. Here he is out here for the Western Department. And McClernand is up here in Dixon, Illinois. A new Army headquarters is able to be built in the replacement pool. So that will allow us to build another Army. One regular cavalry regiment has been raised to react to an enemy raid in West Virginia. Let's take a look over there what's going on. Presumably this is what this is. We have a Confederate Union moving out somewhere and we've we've uh, presumably raised a cavalry regiment somewhere. Camp Dick Robinson volunteer brigades and artillery have been added in Louisville. We gained 20 conscript companies. We gained five tons of war supply and Kentucky units added to the force pool, which means we can now raise forces in Kentucky. Um, if you hold one of these uh, strategic um, um, cities, or I, I don't think it's even just specifically the objective cities, I think it's the strategic cities, like when we hit uh, the uh, F3 button, or the 3 on the uh, on the deal here, we now hold these two strategic cities in Kentucky. If we hold a strategic city in a state, we can raise troops there. So Kentucky is still is still um, neutral, but we have a force in Kentucky or a, a foothold in Kentucky right now at the start. If uh, if the Confederacy was to intervene in Kentucky, they would presumably hold. Um, Bowling Green, which is a strategic town, so they could also raise troops in Kentucky. So that's th that one. What else do we have? New supply units received. We received a supply, a free supply unit in New York. New ships are entering service. And that's it for the scripted events. Now we're going to pop over to the military-related events. Our naval patrols failed to engage the enemy. Cass, Lewis Cass Squadron in the area of the Mississippi Basin. Wherever that's at. Mississippi Basin right here. We only had a 5% chance of it, so that's not, you know, not, uh, un, you know, it's not, not crazy that we failed to do that. Our naval patrols have failed to engage the enemy Nashville transports in the Great Confluent up here. Or if you recall from watching the, uh, the turn go by when we were processing the turn, these guys did just sneak right through the first time.
but then we did catch him when they made it over to uh, Admiral Foote's squadron and he uh, he spanked him pretty good again you see it'll if when after you fight a battle here it will tell you what national morale points were gained during this so nothing there here's the other battle in, in Mississippi confluent this is the gunboat squadron where we just had a, a, just a couple hits impacted now here is here is our uh, our uh, Manassas battle and you can see here we lost two national morale due to that loss so so our morale went down by two and then the Confederates would have gone up by two then so we started with 90 we lost two from battles and we gained five from some of those scripted events that happened so we're sitting here at 93 the Cairo squadron lacking ammo tried not to engage so after those fights that the uh, squadron was in that's over here the Cairo squadron you can see their ammo is at zero so we're gonna have to send them back to port to replenish that and then we had our last battle which was just a little passing nothing was pushed here so we didn't uh, we didn't have the ammunition they didn't have ammunition so we didn't do a whole lot there okay so that is the that's the combat related one now the uh, the movement related messages are going to be ones that are, are generally going to be the largest and most of them you can just kind of scan through and go yeah yeah whatever um, but you can see some things like the Cairo squadron here was delayed two days in Alexandria before it started moving over here we can see Milroy it says he issued conflicting orders and the West Virginia command reverted to a defensive stance what that means is after after the roll to check to see if Milroy was um, activated this turn after we had decided we were going to put him on an offensive stance the role to be activated he failed that role and so he he reverted to a defensive stance since if you're not active you're not allowed to have an offensive stance so that's what that message there is telling you our Florida squadron was delayed to Patterson again same thing happened with Patterson he failed to be activated and we were fully expecting that the Ohio squadron delayed delayed and it says forces have come in forces have joined you can spend as much time reading these as as you care to there's they're basically yep here's the guy he arrived at where you told him to go so there's uh, not a lot in these now there's some things coming up now it does tell you if you had some uh, some units that are becoming active now so we have uh, quite a few uh, naval units that are now active that were not active last turn that uh, mounted volunteers cavalry unit that we looked at in Denver that's active this turn McClellan is active this turn Nathaniel Lyon is active this turn so that's that now this is for replacements levies and new units the soldiers of the 6th Ohio and the 5th Ohio have been successfully trained and these are two of the units that we stuck in here with McClellan if you remember the 6th and 5th Ohio were conscript regiments and we moved them in with McClellan and his ability here now trained these units up to be regular infantry which is which is good because regular infantry is certainly better or line infantry is certainly better than conscript infantry so if you look at these two forces um, the second Ohio and the and the first Ohio Brigade you can see they, they basically have the same force originally if you if you think of these two regiments have of having been conscript regiments is what they were before that matches what the second Ohio is right here and if you see the power of this second Ohio Brigade is 78 and the power of the first Ohio Brigade is 90 and what that's representing is the greater capacity greater ability of these line infantry regiments over the conscript regiments so that's that's why you want to train your units up they they're better uh, the soldiers of Salt Lake City militia have been successfully trained I don't know what these would have been those were just uh, regular regular infantry pre-war US infantry uh, Albuquerque militia have been trained the Arsenal garrison received a infantry unit Richardson's brigade that would be part of 
Butler's command, I think. Yes, so this is a unit here. He has the the chevrons. He had one where one of these was white, and now he has gained that. The 1st Missouri Cavalry gained one. Arsenal Garrison received. 1st Michigan, here we go. These are the guys that we were leaving here on the hope that they would uh, get their other unit, and they certainly have. So, they had the two conscript um, infantry regiments, and now they've just uh, they've just got a uh, a cavalry regiment, conscript cavalry regiment. So that worked out like we'd hoped it would. Okay, next, this is the change of control messages. Okay, here is where the Confederates took over Norfolk Navy Yard, Powder Mail, Ferry, Arbory. If we control click on on this, we'll see. Here's the Norfolk Powder Mail Navy Yard. So they uh, took over this. We didn't have any way of stopping them. So, but this also this is one of those strategic cities, uh, as well as being an objective city, I believe. Norfolk, Norfolk. Yeah. So that's something we we would kind of like to take back. So that's something to something to keep in mind that we might be able to take that back. Your region of control in East Dona Ana, New Mexico, has been reduced to zero. Where's Dona Ana? West East Dona Ana. Right here? Right here. Oh, so we have a unit showing up here with some militia and two irregulars. So something might be happening out here in uh, in New Mexico. Okay, so that is that one. And we'll look at this other one. Now, you don't need to go through these with the various filters. You can leave the filters off and just go through all of them, you know, all mixed together, but I do like to, to divide them up so I can kind of see what's going on. Okay, here's our, our telegraphs are starting to be built here. It takes several turns for that to happen. Transport ships in the shipping lanes. If you recall, we had our our merchant fleet here, and they have delivered 2,113 supply points. So um, not only do these um, provide um, money and war supply they also move move general supply between our uh, between our ports so that we can uh, say bring a, a force and invade along the coast and we'll be able to supply those through our uh, through our sea supply Irvin McDowell has been blamed for suffering a defeat before the enemy new seniority 14 okay one more th one thing that I uh, neglected to mention when I was talking about national morale there's uh, another aspect of that 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 can change your national morale and that is if you decide to change your army command so if we were to dismiss Irvin McDowell right now if we were going to sack him as head of this army it would cost us two national morale and ten victory points and that's because that's obviously with the uh, government sacking the uh, out of an army that's that's not something that's going to reflect very well to the populace and then we're going to lose some some uh, victory points over that and then after we do that say we were to sack McDowell and then we wanted to add some other general in his place say for whatever reason I don't even know if we have another three star around Banks is anyway um, if you want to assign another general in his place uh, if that general is not the most senior general without a command and you um, assign him to command of an army over the head of someone else, that will also cost national morale and victory points to do so. So if you do have your, your good general who's an up-and-comer and you want to put him in charge of an army over the heads of those who are more senior to him, it's going to cost you national morale and victory points to do so. And also, we have this uh, button here that will become active if a if a leader becomes eligible for promotion um, and that that again could possibly be can possibly have a national morale or victory point cost if he seemed to be being promoted over the heads of more senior generals so if you have a, a, a general eligible for both for promotion don't don't just hit the button without reading it first and seeing if you want to pay that cost okay so I think we've looked at everything 
That's been what? Oh, 25 minutes. I do. I do. Uh, I do tend to jabber on, don't I? Well, let's see if we can kind of look at, at what may have happened here in the in the less in the next five minutes, and then we'll call this episode to a close. And then the next episode we'll do the orders for uh, for turn two. Or excuse me, turn. Uh, yeah, turn two. I guess it would be. We can see that Patterson's force made it to um, made it to Harper's Ferry. He's sitting here. He's now under the command of of Butterfield. And this little um, icon here shows that we are besieging the garrison of Harper's Ferry. If you hover over this little icon here, it will tell you what's actually in Harper's Ferry. And you can see um, we have a CSA detachment Harper's Ferry Depot, two units, power 43. So if we can just sit here turn after turn and eventually we'll starve these guys out or we can put these units on a... On, on this assault posture that we talked about earlier and he will assault these fortifications and uh, and then take that and given the uh, the, the difference between the strength of of, uh, of this unit versus garrison I'm sure we'll do that and if uh, Butterfield is activated when that happens he'll do it um, possibly we'll see Johnston come up here and, and, and smack us around trying to stop that from happening but um, these forces that we uh, ordered down here are sitting there Let's hit the uh, military command. That didn't really change in your military control. You can see our, our, our uh, depots look like they may have a little more supply in them. And one thing you can see different now that we didn't see when we were talking about supply. Um, in, the, in the middle of that pop-up, we see supply and ammo received and sent. You can see that those now have values mm -hmm. in them. So Fairfax, Virginia received 92 supply this turn sent zero so it did not send any any supply forward so this unit here did not gain did not pick up any supply from this depot from this region and, and that's obviously because we don't we can't pass supply through this region because we don't control it so what do we got next that we can look at real quick what happened over here in West Virginia West Virginia um, Floyd skedaddled so so we're going to occupy Clarksburg, and we're going to open up the B&O Railroad, so we'll be able to move troops and supply through there. And then after we get our, uh, our 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 units combined and get everything get everything in order, we're going to make a, start making a, an advance on Charleston, eventually Lewisburg, um, and then to Covington or whatnot. We put a put a uh, a threat down to this area. But uh, once we take Clarksburg and Charleston and Lewisburg, the uh, the Confederacy is really not going to be able to contest any of this to to any great extent anymore. They may come out of the uh, Shenandoah Valley and try to try to mess with something, but they're not going to be able to do anything seriously to us there without a, a significant effort. We have this this open opened up here. We talked about that. We talked about what uh, McClellan did. Some of our units here. Uh, this uh, force under Lou Wallace has arrived where where we'd sent him. Fremont has arrived here. We'll put him in charge of the St. Louis Department. The Lion Force, the Lion Force has uh, has become active this 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 turn. We're going to send him down to Rolla. Um, Sterling Price uh, retreated out of Jefferson City as we expect him to. So we'll send Asbeth down here to. To maybe occupy Jefferson City, if we recall, um, Price was in, Price is no slouch here, so uh, we're going to be careful and, and maybe actually end up having a fight down here. But he does appear to be retreating more to Rolla than back to Springfield, as I expected. Here's our uh, Confederate or our uh, cavalry regiments that we brought down here. He's still at full supply. And we see that we do have a cavalry regiment or possibly a brigade here we can't really tell too well Missouri also here is the Missouri State Guard of power 18 so that will be what this what this unit is that's going to be whatever is actually in the gar um, garrison within this town itself this uh, Missouri cavalry unit is not actually in Springfield he's just in this region if he was in Springfield itself his his, his value would show up down here so he's out in this region, and this other unit is actually in Springfield. We don't see anything else. 
anywhere else. So I think now this this is something that's going to bear keeping an eye on this the appearance of this uh, leader down here in uh, in New Mexico. So we're going to want to keep an eye on him. But uh, that's hit about the 30 minute mark. I'm I'm kind of surprised that I spent all this time just talking about what the uh, what the turn showed as as uh, as we progress, I'm not going to spend nearly as much time talking about all of these things and and just going over the same things over and over and over again. So uh, so things will speed up a little bit. But uh, right now um, we're sitting. We've done 30 minutes, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call this episode to an end and and start the next episode where we're gonna give the orders for for the next turn. So I will see you next time.